All right, I'm going to drive the cameraman nuts because I'm going to wander around. So you're going to have to work at it, Dave. Sorry. OK, I want to talk to you about hacking as an act of war. I mean, we're talking about a lot about things, but what are we looking at? The problem is, is that militaries don't change because you win wars or battles. They pretty much only change because they lose them. So what do we have to face in terms of a loss before we go ahead and we learn how to get this right? Or can we skip that stupid step and go right to the smart step? Now, if you look at what is war, if you go back and look at Prussian General von Clausewitz, who talked about war is a continuation of politics by other means. It's another way of saying that generals don't start wars, politicians start wars. And if you think about it, we call in the Defense Department when the Department of State can't complete their mission effectively. And so as a result, what we're looking at is a situation where if all wars are political, what are the political ramifications that we're looking at in cyberspace? Now, the challenge is, as President George W. Bush had said back in 2001, we've got to think differently because America is required to again change the way our military thinks and fights. He wasn't really talking about cyber, but we can apply that same lesson to what we're looking at today. Because I don't know about you, but about a week after 9-11 came out NIMDA, anybody remember that? And so, of course, we're really worried the initial suspicion was, hey, does this have anything to do with the kinetic attacks? Is somebody going to go ahead and combine cyber with kinetic and provide some sort of a unified response that says, wow, we're really going to go up? We find out that actually the answer was, well, no. But somebody stuck that in the back of their mind, and you'll see a little bit later in the presentation, they use that exact one-two punch a little bit later to some pretty good effect. So if we look, go back, let's say, a year and a half ago to RSA and the complete breach of the root certificate, which is coming through what? Social engineering, all right? The carbon side of the network, the weak side, the stuff for which there is no patch for human stupidity. And yet they lost over 700 organizations were later rooted because they still had that trust certificate if the CA revoked, should have been revoked, wasn't revoked, and with the compromise of that root, all the trust downstream was compromised. So were they the real target? Or were they just the ways to get to the true target? Night Dragon, looking at coordinated attack against energy companies. And Nitro, and Shady Rat, Remote Access Trojan. There's some nice write-ups on that one. But it was basically a spear phishing attack to go ahead and get after oh, about 70 different organizations. We're starting to see a pattern here. Go on to 2012. The Israeli Defense Force has been engaged in cyber activity consistently and relentlessly. Am I accusing them of anything? No, that's on their website. They're bragging about that capability. All right, and Saudi Aramco, who's got a whole bunch of empty hard drives for sale on eBay right now, trying to figure out, is like, hey, you want to use it? You know, just use gently and wipe really, really hard. But what we find out is that we look at all the different things that are taking place that are out there, and organizations are ramping up their capabilities. Nation states are ramping up their capabilities. And the problem is, is that organizations like Saudi Aramco, not a specific government target, not a military target, but yet a very, very valid target nonetheless because of the fact that they control a lot of critical assets for that nation with the potential implication that the compromise of those assets, i.e., can you get into the oil fields and shut down production or cause worse problems, could have global ramifications in terms of the price of oil and the international balance of power depending upon what countries export oil and what does that do for their economies. I'll let you connect the dots on that one. But probably the biggest danger we're looking at is the theft of intellectual property. We're seeing a massive sucking sound going off to the east, where what's happening is, is that the Western nations that have built and created all this intellectual property and capability is now going away and it's being sent over to other organizations, other nations, other nation states. And the big problem is, like you heard in the last thing, oh, what do you do about non-US citizens being accused of US law? Well, here's a quick question for you. In the United States, what is their form of government? It is not a democracy. It is a, it is a republic, OK? Democracy is when 51% of the people can vote the other 49% into slavery. Republic goes ahead and says that we can go ahead and have representative you know, who will go and go vote on our behalf. OK, so what is the governmental system of planet Earth? Anarchy. Anarchy is correct. Give that guy a teddy bear. Because anarchy means nobody's in charge. And the reality is, sorry, United Nations, you are not in charge. And so as a result, what happens is when you get nation state versus nation state, how do you enforce the consequences? You can't really go ahead and say, I want to sue you in court. No, what do you do? You demarch them with the Department of State and that doesn't work. Call it Department of Defense, special delivery. <laughs> well,
Well, you know, right now we got to wonder, is, that, is this stuff approaching the act level of an act of war? Because if somebody came in here and broke into all of our organizations and stole our secrets, or better, worse yet, broke onto an Air Force base, stole a couple joint strike fighters, maybe stole a couple aircraft carriers, stole a couple submarines, things like that. Uh, Air Force, what do you, steal some really killer golf clubs? And <laughs> what you'll find out is that that theft of intellectual property and their capabilities, we would say, hey, we're at war. The problem is they're stealing it bit by bit or bite by bite or torrent by torrent, and as a result, we're still suffering the same loss, but the concern is the implication of that damage is just as bad. Now, if we have bad security in the physical security realm, for those of us who have been overseas in combat environments, you recognize that bad things happen both to your equipment and to your people. And if you have insufficient fiscal security, what can happen is you can lose your stock market, you could go ahead and crash an economy. But if you have insufficient information security, eventually what you can do is you knock out critical infrastructure and you can really mess up an organization or a nation state. And now we've got a concern about that third case, could somebody do some serious, serious damage to the United States of America? If you look at the Department of Defense strategy for operating in cyberspace, it identifies a number of cyber threats. We've got external actors. Okay, these are the typical bad guys, the, you know, the usual crowd. The insider threats, the malicious, the political, the financial motivation. Hey, you know, why do people go bad on you? Because they want money, they want power, they want fame, they want something. But there's also supply chain vulnerability. There's more than just watching a tsunami come in there than take out a nuclear power plant, that one-two punch disrupting your supply chain that you set up so you can no longer manufacture Toyotas because the left wiper blade factory got wiped out entirely. And Dr. Deming, who said, you know, go to one single supplier, really shortened down our supply chains for just-in-time inventory so all of a sudden we could be just out of time because you don't have to take out the Toyota plant. I only need to take out one small critical element of that. And we look at the ability to degrade the Department of Defense operational capability. We really, really need to be able to protect that. We learned some lessons when we were over there in the uh, Balkans and watching what happened there with kind of the attacks going on. It can get a whole lot worse. The problem isn't so much that you are a target, is that you are the target. And the concern is that who's doing the targeting? Is it these folks? Who here is with Anonymous? <laughs> Every now and then you get like, cross that, dude, you're out. Okay. All right. No, you're too stupid then to be an Anonymous. Okay. But it's not these guys or these folks, which are whom? Oh, I always thought it was the planter's peanuts on steroids. Um, it's, it's these guys. All right. Nations that are going ahead and manning up and training vast armies of people, because you look at this massive amount of information that's going, what, the volume of the Library of Congress getting sucked out every year? Who's got enough people to go through that thing? Uh, yeah, I know somebody's got a couple billion people. So maybe they can go ahead if they got the bandwidth to deal with this stuff. Now, we talked about Shady Rat a few minutes ago. Ongoing attacks is around mid-2006. Documented targets. Federal government agencies, defense contractors, United Nations. What was very, very interesting is looking at the run-up prior to August 8th, 19, or 2008. What happened on 888, by the way? Yeah, in where? Beijing, China. If you're Chinese, number eight is lucky. It's fortuitous, okay? And so as a result, what an opportunity to go out on a world stage where you want to make sure it's done really, really well. So some of these targets were the IOC and National Olympic Committees and the World Anti-Doping Agency. So who could possibly be doing all these particular attacks? I don't know. <laughs> Because you know what? It's plausible deniability. I didn't do it. Nobody saw me. You can't prove anything. And that's the real problem we face in cyber war is attribution. Being able to prove unequivocally that that is your targeter. And so we take a look at some of the reports. There's an FBI report that supposedly was leaked. The journalist reported at least 180,000 Red Army cyber spies. Who here is the United States Marine Corps? No Uras in here? OK, how big is the United States Marine Corps? Not much bigger. And so we find out it's something that force that size is being aimed against us, potentially. So who's doing it? Who, me? You know? <laughs> um, could they have done these things? No, no possible way. But yet we need more than just a scapegoat or a whipping boy to go ahead and say, well, hey, guess what? It's all China. Well, it's not necessarily all China. And oh, by the way, I got to tell you, if I were advising the Chinese government, if I were Chinese and national and that were my country, Hell, I'd be doing the same thing, too. Why not? We're a soft, easy target, relatively speaking, so why not do that? And if you go back and you go into the Chinese philosophy, we talked about Clausewitz as being kind of the seminal thinker for Western warfare. You go back to Eastern thinking, and who do you find? You find Sun Tzu. And in book one, page one, paragraph one, line one, the very beginning of that, he says, all warfare, all warfare is based 
on deception. Okay? Now, Professor Leota at the War College said all warfare tends toward asymmetry, which means what? Small input, large output. Okay? Think things like 9-11 attacks. All right? Not a whole lot of money to train up a bunch of people. Huge, huge impact on the back end. But I went back and I reread Machiavelli's The Prince. And he says there's no avoiding war. It's only going to be postponed to the advantage of others. So for some people who say we're not yet in a full-fledged cyber war, even though the capabilities are out there, you have to ask, why not? And to whose advantage is this being postponed? If we take a look at some of the information out there, and this is a report to Congress from the Office of the National Counterintelligence Executive, points out that China is a persistent collector, an opportunity for the first two decades of this century for economic growth. Now, we look at the Economic Espionage Act, and the hard part is, we talked about in the last hour, how do you go ahead and bring people who are not necessarily in the U.S., but here U.S. potential folks collecting for whom? China, six out of seven times. And we look at all the things that are happening out there, and we say, well, hey, now, this is a potential bad boy out there, but they're not acting alone. We find out that Russia out there has extensive capability, some real sophisticated operations. Remember the Russian uh, intelligence illegals that got arrested and got rolled up? That was a couple years ago. And so then we have, of course, what we call our U.S. partners. And the problem with U.S. partners is now we've got to be politically sensitive. Because who are we talking about here? France, Israel, the usual suspects again. But now from a perspective, say, wait a minute, these are supposed to be our friends. These are supposed to be our allies, and they're collecting against us big time. So you ever go on Air France, and you happen to be fortunate enough to sit in a first-class seat, speak at a little of microphones inside the headset. Or better yet, if you have a nice something you can generate a lot of power, <laughs> jam them. Because what you'll find out is that all's fair in love and war over there, because if your government owns Airbus and your government also owns the intelligence services, what's wrong with sharing that information? Hey, it makes sense. But if we were to have our CIA go ahead and collect, or our NSA go ahead and collect, and then provide that information to American industry to make them more competitive in a global marketplace, everybody would go nuts. And so what we find out then is that we're in an environment, anarchy, that does not necessarily give us a good recourse to go ahead and appeal to the emperor and say, hey, I want this thing fixed. Rather, what you're going to find out is that we've got to be able to defend ourselves on our own. Let's take a look at a little bit of history lessons. A lot of us remember Estonia, 2007. What happened? Downtown Tallinn, statue of Russian liberators, because after all, they liberated Estonia. Estonians didn't quite think about it the same way from 1945 through about 1989, but, you know, so what? They're going to move that statue someplace else. A lot of people got upset about the whole concept and started a big kind of denial of service attack going against a lot of the electronic organization of Estonia. Why Estonia? It turned out that they were probably the most wired nation in the country, in the world at the time, in terms of their government and their infrastructure dependent upon electronic commerce. And so it turned out that what came out of that? Well, hey, remember NATO now, we need some technical assistance. But the attack was with bits, not bombs. And we're saying, what happened? Who did it? Who done it? Do we still know who did it? Well, they point to the Russians, they point to the Russian business network, they point to an ethnic Russian who is a resident of Estonia. But there's, again, a real, real problem of attribution. But the interesting thing that came out of it is that there was no Demarche. There was no bombs being dropped on somebody else. There was no invasion against somebody else. And somebody took note of that and said, hmm, you could do a cyber attack and nobody does anything back to you? Wow, let's try it again. <laughs> because here's our response. Yeah, we didn't even schmooze all them. <laughs> what do we do? We're going to call for a cyber defense policy. We're going to go ahead and establish a center for excellence in Tallinn, Estonia, which is a pretty good place to do it. I've not been there. But we got a set, well, Europe, Euro Atlantic Partnership Council. Oh, we're a guest. We're going to hold a seminar. Ooh. Okay. Science for Peace and Security. We'll establish some response teams. Okay. And we'll hold it. We'll hold a summit. Wow. That's going to teach them. <laughs> Heck of a response. So what happens a year later? By the way, August 2008. Remember a few slides back? What's happening? Everybody's watching. Da, 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 da. You know, the guy running around. And meanwhile, what happens over here in Georgia? As you go into Abkhazia, South Ossetia provinces, which are on the border with Russia, and the Russians begin with a massive cyber attack against the government of Georgia and then roll the tanks. And so now you've got that one two punch where you're thinking, might have happened in 2001, now it's happening for real in 2008. And the defenses were disrupted. It turned out through the reports that I've heard is that the government of Georgia had talked to, you know, I think it was president, had talked to some guy who was the president of a company in Atlanta, Georgia, who ran a 
Hosting company is like, hey, you know, my systems are under attack. Says, hey, move your hosting over here. Okay, fine. Well, then they became under attack over there. Well, what does that make us then? Are we a participant in this war? By the way, I got to give Putin credit. He didn't go in there with his crack troops. He didn't go in there with his best possible forces. He went in with a marginal tank force that was just enough to win the war. Now, he could always have just clobbered them. But by just kind of eking out a win, he was able to go back and say, you know what, we need more money for defense because we could have almost been defeated here. And they, they bought it and he got more money. Good for him. So now we're really going to get serious about it. <clears throat> we're going to hold a declaration. Yeah, without reading the whole declaration here, we find out that we have a policy on cyber defense and the need for nations to protect the information. Yeah, yeah. Well, stop declaring stuff and just go do it. Because we recognize that we're in a hostile environment. We're now finally seeing up the marrying of cyber attack with kinetic attack. And so what's the problem is, is going forward as the logical progression is, is that's going to become the militarization of cyberspace, a natural extension of warfare, just like the Billy Mitchell back in 1920s and 30s trying to go ahead and convince the U.S. government and the U.S. Department of Defense that aviation is going to be key to war fighting. And what did they do to Billy Mitchell? They court-martialed him. And yet we find out Battle of Midway and then going forward that aviation is incredibly important. That battle was fought between carriers that never, ever saw each other. It was all fought by aircraft. So what's happening is warfare, it's changing. And so now the question is, if a computer is sabotaged and it's coming and the attack's coming from another country, is that an act of war? What do you do when you're subject to uh, a cyber attack? So here's a trivia question for you. Since you've been pretty good at trivia, we'll give you a tough one. When was the last time the United States formally declared war? Against whom? No, it was not against Germany. That was one of the... Japan. That was, they were, no, they were first in World War II. Who was the last time that we declared war? Google, 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 Google. It turns out, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania. Who'd have known? June of 1942. Since then, we have never operated under a declaration of war. We've done police actions. We have done interventions. We have done you know, assistance visits and things like that. But the thing is, is that we've avoided this formal declaration of war. Because with that comes a lot of other implications. We want to make sure that, well, we really know what we're doing. And now, as we look at it, we say, well, have we ever operated in cyberspace before? Have we ever been thinking about that? Because what we're realizing is that there is some good pre-cyber warfare doctrine that's out there. This is not going to say, require us to go ahead and say, scratch everything, start from scratch. But there are ways that we've used information in the past. So let's look at it from a military perspective. And historically, what did we do when we thought about doing information and operating in that sphere? Well, we called it information operations. Wow. And what is information? We talk about the national power. And anybody who's been to the war colleges understand that there's elements of national power. We break them out, D-I-M-E. You've got diplomatic, information, military, and economic. And if you think about it, any one of these four different elements could be used to exert forces on other nations. So we talk about doing diplomatic and sanctions and things like that, going against North Korea, perhaps. You've got military actions you can take against other nations and things like that, economic sanctions against Iran, you start to see that these are the toys that are in the play box for governments to go ahead and exercise their elements of power. Now here's some, you know, you say the problem is that we usually focus on the M. Why? How big is the U.S. State Department? How many employees worldwide in the U.S. State Department? I hear 100,000. Do I hear 400,000? Lower, lower. We'd be here all day trying to get down to about 6,000. What's the crew of a Nimitz-class carrier fully manned when you're out at sea? About 6,500, okay? The entire U.S. State Department can fit on one carrier. Is there any wonder why you want to push the big M button on the response thing? Because there you're going to go ahead and get able to get a huge disproportionate response. But the thing is, is that that I button is almost never used. We understand diplomacy. We understand economic sanctions. We understand how to do this in the military. But we know how to do information stuff. And all of a sudden, we realize that a lot of our senior decision makers have their AARP cards. And it means that, you know, they get the little jitterbug phones that things, you know, with the big numbers on it. And, and you know, don't look at me. I've already got my renewal card coming from those guys, so it's a little bit scary. I know who stole that veteran's laptop because my invitation to AARP came right on schedule. <laughs> but we realize that our senior decision makers tend not to push the I button because I don't think they necessarily fully understand how to do it yet. Now, we're getting better. But if we take a look at our information operations doctrine, we find out the United States and NATO and even the Germans, you know, they've got lots of stuff you can look at out there. And they say, great, we've got some context we can work with. This cyber warfare stuff is not just all random and it's not all different. It's something we can deal with. So let's go ahead and take a look at the U.S. information operations. Can we do so? Yes. 
because it turns out that the draft, which came out in 2003, which was secret, has now been declassified. Awesome. So average people can go take a look at it. You ready to take a look at the United States Information Operations Roadmap? Here's how we're going to do it. Oh, jeez. A little bit of redaction here. So I don't know. How are we going to do this? We've got to figure out something else. So we, it turns out that, now this is my hierarchy here. There's a hierarchy of understanding that I think takes place as we try to go ahead and figure out, as we take actions, what do we base them on? And because if we're going to take action, we should first base that on some sort of a doctrine, which tells us how we should act. Well, if we're going to write doctrine, which is important because it makes sure you're consistent, your doctrine should be accordance to what? Policies. National policies, how do we do things like that? How do we develop our policy? Where's the policy coming from? Strategy, yes. And the strategy is correct if it's based upon what? Yeah, your understanding or your national interests, which is going to be ultimately be based on wisdom, which unfortunately is <laughs> not a line item you can order anybody. You can't go to the doctor, I need 100 cc's of wisdom for all my senior leaders. You either get it or you don't. You trade a lot of your time in your life, and you hopefully get back wisdom, but some people just get older, and they don't get wise. So if we try to aspire to making sure that this chain is intact, we have to make sure that if we don't understand information operations at the senior level, it's unlikely we're going to take, ultimately, the correct actions, because that chain breaks. And so if you look at the definition of information operations, I'm not going to bore you. If you want to go ahead and download Joint Pub 3 tac 13 you're welcome to it. Read up on it. But the whole idea is, is that we're trying to go ahead and alter the adversary's ability to make a decision or affect their perceptions so they see things that aren't there. They are given hallucinations to look at. They think all the Soviet missiles are coming over the horizon when, in fact, it's an untested radar system bouncing off the rising moon. Yeah, go back and check your archive book. Somebody in the U.S. was fortunate not to push the button because they thought there was a massive strike coming. So you realize that our sensors can fool us, but good information operations means that someone's going to try to fool our sensors. And ultimately, if they get inside our decision-making process, we're going to make the wrong choices. And if we make the wrong choices, ultimately we'll take the wrong actions, which works to the benefit of our adversaries. By the way, ends, ways, and means, you ever heard about those things? The way we do that, these are the means to get there, and the ends is ultimately what our goal is. So why even bother to do information operations? Because it turns out that dominant powers, we tend to think of ourselves as a dominant power, but hey, you know, that's a U.S. myopia that's really only been around since about 1945. Prior to that, we were very much isolationist post-World War I, and prior to that, you know, we didn't deal with any, you know, what do we do, Spanish-American War, you know, stuff like that. It wasn't really all that big. The United States pretty much said, leave us alone. And if you go back and you read your history books, in mid-2001, when I was a student at the Naval War College, we were talking about the Powell Doctrine. Colin Powell, who had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, now becoming Secretary of State, who understands that when you hang up the phone on state and pick up the phone on defense, that people start to die and they get hurt and they get injured. And we saw Powell's original effort in the Bush administration is pulling the U.S. out of areas that were not part of our core strategic interests. We're going to back out of Bosnia. We're going to back out of places like Somalia, reduce our forces in South Korea, and things like that. And basically, the U.S. is going to take care of the U.S. And on September 11, 2001, somebody dangled some bait in front of us that we just could not resist, and it totally disrupted that whole process. But it's interesting to think what a different world it would have been had the United States continued that retractive process. But for the most part, as a dominant power, what do you want to do? You want to maintain that dominance, right? If you're a lesser power, you want to use this asymmetrically to go ahead and offset the fact that you might not have the economic resources and the military resources, or you can't bring the diplomatic pressure to bear, but you can potentially bring this pressure to bear. And if you're an insurgent, a rebel, you can go ahead and go after the public opinion. Remember, this is information operations. So you look at things like the Zapatistas down in Mexico or other places like that were taking place in the Balkans that we find out that trying to shape the population's viewpoint of what's going on is a huge way to influence the outcome. Clausewitz was talking about the other triad of war. You've got to have both the government and the military and what? The will of the people. What caused us to lose Vietnam? It wasn't the fact that our government failed. It wasn't the fact that they had more power than the United States military. It was the will of the people was constantly corroded and shipped away and used against us, at which point the U.S. walked away and gave up. Now, we've got some basis for it. 
because we realize that in information operations, we can create a lot of damage for relatively low cost. You don't have to have a standing army. You don't even have to put your troops in harm's way. You could be sitting there 11,000 miles away and run just an effective operation as somebody's trying to smuggle into an organization or break in with the potential of getting caught and interrogated. And then, of course, it makes sense. So it turns out that information and operations are going to work really, really well against us. Why? Because we have this huge reliance on our IT systems. Oh, the computer told us so. Anybody ever says, oh, it must be true, it's on the Internet, right? You ever get that from people? <laughs> oh, my goodness. But now, well, my computer can't be wrong. Or you ever call it, that's a computer mistake. No, computers don't make mistakes. They do exactly what you tell them to. It's just like the idiot who programmed and told you to do something wrong. <laughs> How many lines of code in Windows 7? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. The problem is you got stuck going all the way back to 1981 in there. And so the re, you know, it's not like you've got all the source code in one big repository. All right, there's some things we can no longer build. For example, the lunar lander. Nobody saved a copy of the blueprints. Seriously, we got one, but we have to reverse engineer it because all that stuff got thrown away. But the tobacco companies, which they did that with their information from the 1960s, would have saved them about 40 or $50 billion. Good reason for document retention policy. But what you can do is you get inside an opponent's decision cycle. Okay, what we used to call it is uh, John Boyd, Colonel Boyd, called the OODA loop. You observe, orient, detect, act. And so what you want to do is if it takes you 15 seconds to figure out what's going on and respond, but I can do my responses in 10 seconds, I can constantly move faster than you can, eventually I will win. And that whole doctrine came out from the fighter pilot mentality, saying if I can get inside the other pilot's decision cycle, I'm going to win the dogfight every time. But now what we find out is we can affect the integrity of your systems, which means what? That you might have information that's no longer trustworthy anymore. I can affect the availability through dosing it or selectively dosing it, or the confidentiality by just simply compromising and taking it away. We a lot of times get obsessed on the C, the confidentiality and the loss of information, and we forget that just as critical as the I and the A. And so they're going to potentially influence our perceptions, which is going to affect our decisions and go back to that tree, affect our actions, and cause us to do the wrong things under the circumstances. So there's a lot of players out there. We talked about China. And Sun Tzu also in that same treatise had said, the acme of skill is to win without fighting. If you don't have to put your army into the battlefield and you can still win, that is the acme of skill. RBN, Al-Qaeda, organized crime, hackers sometimes getting hired above it. The whole dynamic has changed back in the 80s, 90s, and things like that. In the old days, if you were hackers, why? You did it because it was intellectual curiosity. Then later, you maybe you did a little bit of mischief. Now, there's a lot of malice going on out there. and People find out a zero day is worth a lot of money on the dark black market. And so the danger that we see now is that a lot of smart people are getting lured over to the dark side, not because they're necessarily ideologically aligned with other organizations, but there's a real big financial incentive. So, hey, why not? Someone's going to figure out about this thing anyway. You might as well cash in on it. So what do we do? Well, there are some things we can do. One of them is called self-defense. And under NATO, Article 5, we have something called mutual defense. And if an ally of NATO is attacked, Every other member of NATO will come to the rescue. Sounds pretty good. Now, the idea was because the Russians and Soviets were going to come pouring through the Fulda Gap through East Germany, we always figured about, okay, well, this whole thing was going to defend ourselves, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, against the evil Soviet Union rummaging into Western Europe and taking the whole place over. Well, as the Soviet Union collapsed and then NATO tended to grow and stuck around because it turned out that, hey, it was a nice forum to communicate, then Eastern Europe wants to be in there. Ukraine would love to be a full member of NATO. Who wants to go to war to defend Ukraine? Because we're finding out that, well, how about if Georgia? And now when the Russians rolled on them, how many other nations are allied with the United States in our war in Afghanistan? Operation Enduring Freedom. Four or five? Ten? About 30. All 26 members of NATO. Hey, there we go because the only time this thing was ever invoked was September 12, 2001, and some other nations like Korea, Australia, and things like that, which, oh, by the way, some of them, like the Koreans, had a very, very ugly exit from there. If you remember the public beheading of the Korean citizen that caused Korea to back up and get out of that alliance. And so what the problem is, is that what do we do in cyber? If we think a cyber can be an act of war, and now there's a cyber attack that paralyzes the government or goes after the critical infrastructure or, heaven forbid, releases nuclear waste into the countryside in one of our NATO allies, are we going to go ahead and send our sons and daughters and brothers and sisters over there to fight a kinetic war in defense? 
And that's the equation that we've never yet completed yet because we haven't necessarily made the jump from cyber to kinetic and putting our own people at risk. United Nations also has something similar called Article 51. And it permits individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs. So this has happened a lot. You go back and you read the history books. This was great, 1950, what happened? The Soviet delegate walked out of the United Nations protesting something. No, it was not Khrushchev banging his shoe on the table. That was bad later. But what happened is the American was pretty smart. He said, um, see how the room? Yeah. Hey, can we pull this resolution to go ahead and vote on Article 51 to go into Korea? All in favor? All opposed? OK, we got it. And we're in. After that, so we re represented, we're told not to walk out of those meetings anymore. <laughs> and we find out this takes place over and over and over again. By the way, the Soviet Union challenged the legality of NATO in 1951 under the self-defense, saying, hey, they're ganging up on us. But the whole thing that came out of it wasn't so much to say they did not get that validated because, well, first of all, they kind of got a vote on it. But the second one is, well, they're not actually doing things to you. But what about anticipatory self-defense? Well, now things get a little bit interesting because we talked about Rumsfeld and some of that doctrine that came out a few years back saying that, hey, rather than wait to go ahead and take a hit, if we see somebody lining up, let's go ahead and take them out early. Anticipatory self-defense. Very, very difficult because now how do you prove this guy was lining up to hit you? It wasn't just reaching back into his back pocket because he's got a bad shoulder or something like that. And so the day built to determine it. And so there's some justification criteria that are out there. And Israel has used that. The United States invoked that, sort of. We consider it anticipatory self-defense because of the intelligence data that we said so that there's nuclear materials there and we need to do something about it. So sometimes your justifications can be valid. Sometimes your justifications may have some questionable basis based upon what you can release to the world. But the thing is that countries and nations do this, and they will continue to do this, as anticipatory. So enter the Talon Manual. Remember, we talked about the... United, the uh, NATO Center of Cyber Excellence being set up in Tallinn. Well, now roll the clock forward a little bit here. In 2009, there is a group of folks that have put together to create a doctrine on how do we apply kinetic war laws to cyber war laws. And it turned out the director is Professor Schmidt at the U.S. Naval War College. And although you can go to that website and look at an online preview, they have not yet published a document. It's going to come out, I think, next month. But he sent me a copy of it a few months back on a provision that I agreed not to propagate it, but I was able to download it, play with it, read it, and look at it, and say, hey, where does this come from? What's interesting about the Talon Manual is that the general principles of international law ought to apply to cyberspace, right? It's not a fourth, you know, different dimension. It's not a different planet. But it turns out that if you take a look at how many treaties are out there that deal with cyber warfare, the answer is zero. There is no legal basis for defining cyber war. And so what they did is they said, let's go ahead and by consensus, and man, I don't know how you do that by consensus, but they said that whole document was by consensus, that they were able to go through and apply all these different provisions about what are the laws of war as compared to cyber. and came up with 95 different ways to look at it. So what they do is they're trying to govern cyber warfare and they look at it before war, during war, activities below the use of force are not addressed. So if you cannot equate an action to a use of force, like somebody goes ahead and DOSes you, well, it's not really a use of force because when the DOS stops, the DDoS stops, you get your systems back up. But if they were able to go ahead and do a kinetic equivalent, such as, hmm, all my centrifuges seem to break, <laughs> could that then qualify as cyber activity that could then go under cyber warfare? And the answer would be yes under these definitions. And so what it's desi designed to do is to come up with a basis of how we start thinking about how do we justify this and how do we set a rule set. And so it's not meant to reflect NATO doctrine, even though it was sponsored by NATO, but they brought in other organizations, other people, other academics to try to define this. And they came out with 95 rules of cyber warfare, which you could go nail onto the side of the internet. So I'm not going to go through all 95, because frankly, some of them aren't that interesting. We don't have time. But I will take a look at a number of them. How about rule nine? Injured state may resort to proportionate countermeasures, including cyber. Well, the whole key there is what? Proportionate. OK, if somebody shoots a rifle across your border, you're not supposed to launch a thermonuclear weapon back. You're supposed to shoot a rifle back. And you kind of go up, escalate in kind. All right, so how about cyber operations consider use of force when effects are comparable to non-cyber use of force? Yeah, we just talked about that a moment ago. But here we can do self-defense. 
But again, this whole thing, they are not inventing these rules. They are looking at the body of law that's been out there that's in the international community. And yes, by the way, we do have some things international, like Geneva Conventions and how you treat prisoners and things like that. And that's where they got their basis for how they map these things in here. So cyber operations, we look at Estonia. What do they do? A lot of DDoS against the government and banking and infrastructure. But when the DDoS stopped, nothing was broken. So does not qualify. Georgia, hmm, level of armed conflict, going after Department of Defense, the government blinding them, accompanying it with a kinetic attack. Absolutely, cyber is an element there. This is interesting. Your commanders could be considered criminally responsible for cyber war crimes. Well, how do we define a cyber war crime? That gets really interesting. I mean, what if you shut off the power to a hospital and lots of people die? Or you go ahead and you doss an orphanage or something, and you know, now you're starting to wonder, are these war crimes killing innocent kids and children and stuff like that? If, if they're the target as compared to collateral damage, which is how we sort of justify that, well, you know, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Sorry you got blown up, you know. We've got to be careful there. Now, it turns out, this is interesting. You look at combatant status. The Geneva Convention has a way that's defined. So if your grandfather were in World War II over in Europe, and now at the age of 88 goes over to go to Oktoberfest, they can't arrest him at Frankfurt Airport and say, you know what? You killed my grandfather on a battlefield. You're guilty of murder. I'm going to take you to court. Because armed conflict, he's in uniform, he's in uniform, they're fighting by the laws. That's the way it goes. Now, if someone were over there saying, hey, you know, I want to be Jack the Ripper over in Germany, and be Hans the Ripper or something like that, and start killing people, yeah, that's a crime. But you point that out. What's interesting is malicious volunteer cords, irregulars are unprivileged, but get this. If you do not, quote, commanded by a person responsible for his subordinates, you are by definition not entitled to the protection of combatant status or immunity, and therefore you are always a criminal. I don't know if the non-entity that organized or anonymous, because there's nobody at the top, thought about that, but it technically makes anonymous by international convention all participants being illegal combatants and not subject to protection. Regardless of how important you think your actions are, if there's nobody at the top, you're op operating extra legally. Mercenaries, no immunity and things like that. Cyber terrorism prohibited, not sure how you define that. Uh, this is interesting though, but if it has both a military and a civilian objective, like an airport or a power station or maybe fresh water supply, now you're starting to really get into fuzzy areas, it's a legitimate target. What I thought was interesting is that a cyber booby trap is prohibited. What does that mean, no Trojan horses? <laughs> Click here to open this, no, I can't do that, sorry, rule losses, rule 44. Uh, but I can use ruses so I can honeypot you but I can't download some corrupted PDFs. Uh, good news to know that I can do cyber espionage. Thank you very much. Not like that there's been a problem lately, but get this. If you've got some really bright kids under the age of 15, they can't hack. At least they can't hack and be part of war because they are child combatants, okay? We're back to the children's crusades here. So you've got to be really, really cautious about that. Now, the thing is, is that diplomatic communications are protected from cyber operations at all times. Okay, I get the idea of a diplomatic pouch, but seriously, if you're sending bits and you got bad crypto, bad on you, okay? Cyber belligerence. Neutral states cannot allow belligerents to act from a neutral cyber infrastructure. What about this U.S. thing when they went ahead in Georgia and moved their stuff to, uh, well, Atlanta? Would that make the United States a combatant in the war between Russia and Georgia, which is not really declared, and it was all running under the national, international coverage of the Olympics, and not too many people were paying attention to that. Interesting. So our environment is changing, and that means our target, or the list of enemies' targets is getting bigger. As we go to smartphones, tablets, dual loose, the bring your own device, while BIOD has got to be the best thing if you're an opponent of the United States because you're shredding any carefully established policies. And if you were the bad guys, you would love to see the demise of BlackBerry because there goes the last chance for having good portable device security. Anybody get one of the new BlackBerry 10s yet? You have one? You have a beta. What do you think? Is, is it going to save the company? You hope. How many Chinese shares of stock have you bought then since you bought it, got the beta? Ah, well, you got to follow through on your actions, right? All in or not in. Okay, we have a cultural shift. We want free access to information from anywhere, right? So what happens? Oh, wow, free Wi-Fi. Let's connect to it. Hmm, who knows what's going on in there? And of course, a geopolitical shift, what's happening is activities and knowledge. It turns out you don't necessarily have to have a huge 
resource base to be able to be a player. If you look at the natural resources of the country like Japan, very, very low on the scale, but in the 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 80s, they were able to become an economic powerhouse by the correct application of using things that had nothing to do with just mining out of your own backyard. And so what happens is the principal threats aren't going to change anytime soon. I don't think all of a sudden we're going to see the Chinese say, hey, you know what, we're so sorry about that. No more of this silly stuff. Let's just be, let's be friends, brother. But what we're going to see is some potential game changers that are out there. What's interesting is that um, Tom Holt, who's a professor at Michigan State, did a little bit of research trying to figure out, could people go ahead and re be recruited as civilian cyber warriors? And so if you look at the Stanley Milgram experiments, anybody remember those from the early 1960s? What was that whole principle? Hey, could Americans do what the Germans were recruited to do? Would someone actually push a button and cause someone else to be killed? And it turned out that by setting up an experiment, guy with a clipboard, someone on the other side of there who's a, you know, a participant, but saying every time they get a wrong answer, you increase the voltage. And oh, by the way, the guy's had a heart problem, so don't worry about that. He said people kept getting higher and higher, and he starts to see screams and hollers, and then all of a sudden, like, no noise at all. <laughs> it's like, guy's on the floor. It's like, but I should stop. No, you shouldn't. It's an experiment. It's okay. We're in charge. And the presence of a guy with a white lab coat and a clipboard pushed a number of people to go right past the point of where you realistically think that you're killing somebody else because they felt that there was somebody else in charge. So it turns out is if you want to take a look and say, not just is somebody in charge, but just would you be really willing to play? Because, hey, this is like an all-volunteer force, right? So let's see what we got for all-volunteer cyber warrior. And so four questions or four axes on there. You commit physical attacks against your own country, and then cyber attacks, and of course against somebody else's country as well. What was interesting is that if someone was willing to go ahead and break into the front door or, or break into a building, they were probably willing to break into a system or hack into a system as well. Hmm, that's not so much cyber capabilities, it's just who are you? And it really had very little to do with patriotism. They asked, do you love your country? Yes. Are you going to hack against them? Sure, why not? It had nothing to do with it. And the piracy is really coordinated. So if you were downloading songs and killing kittens as a little kid off of Napster, chances are you're willing to go do this stuff. So what, I read Tom's research, and I sent him back, and I said, you know what? you got all these little attempts to correlate stuff. It looks like just people are self-selected, and they act on their own priorities, not national. And he was so close to the data, he never he, he's like, yeah, you're right. So sometimes if you're writing, if you're doing some good stuff from the outside, look at it. But let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Dr. Tom Adams. Now, Tom Adams wrote, and this was in the Army War College parameters, warfare has begun to leave human space. Because what's happening is, is things are becoming too fast and too complex for us to direct. And what's going to happen is we're just going to have to pretend that we're in control. And one of the real concerns we have here is that, that the rate and the pace of cyber is going beyond the ability to get within the side of human decision loop. That OODA loop that we measure in seconds is now going up against an opponent that's automated that's going in milliseconds or microseconds or nanoseconds or picoseconds or femtoseconds or whatever you have to be measured against. The whole point is that we're not well equipped to go ahead and man up to say, hey, look, we think there's a problem. We're not going to get the seven months that we had in 1990, 1991 to go ahead and, hey, let's go ahead and move tanks, let's go ahead and move fuel, let's move people, get everybody else lined up all against this Kuwait border, and then go ahead and try that old left hook. Rather, what happens is, is that it's going to be come as you are, and you have to respond, and it turns out that unless you've got automated systems, it's not going to work. By the way, he wrote that in 2001. My observations. My concern is that a lot of the senior military officials are in their 50s and their 60s. Not that it's not so bad. I mean, I don't have much choice about it. But if you didn't grow up with this stuff, it's hard to think inside the wire. In my opinion, hacking is like a foreign language. If you learn it late in life, you're going to speak it with an accent. If you learn it while you're young enough, you speak it as a native. And we don't have native speakers at the highest decision levels yet. Now, the Naval Academy of the Art, West Point, other academy, service academies, for I think for the last 11 years, have been doing the cyber warfare curriculum, and that's great. If we can only get the bad guys to wait another 19 or 20 years, they're going to be up at the two and three and four star levels in their careers, and we're ready to go. But meanwhile, we've got a hugely knowledgeable cyber capability down here at this level, but all the decision makers are taking place up here. And so it turns out, oh, by the way, why did I exclude Israel? You have to retire by the age of 45 as a general. It's a young man's war over there, or young woman's war. So think inside the wire. Can you do that? I hope we're not in for an unpleasant surprise. Because my concern is, is that when nuclear weapons were first invented, they were used in warfare. We haven't been using them since. But the concern is they're going to get used again. You don't create a weapon without ultimately using it. 
And that's been the real concern when we're talking about cyber is that we're building these capabilities, we're creating these tools, and particularly when you have things like zero days, there's a shelf life on it. Zero days are like milk, they're not like wine. They don't get better with age. At some point in time, they just, they spoil and you gotta throw them out because they don't work anymore. But because there's been very little or cons no consequence in the past, why not? And so as a result, I think we're emboldening other organizations, other nation states, to go ahead and think of cyber as a valid attack vector. And you got a low cost of entry. So you don't have to go ahead and have a lot of capabilities. You look at the economy of a nation like North Korea, but for heaven's sakes, most of their people are malnourished. They pray with almost nobody, and yet they've detonated, well, what, three nuclear devices? They have a missile program. They put something up into orbit. And supposedly they have a cyber capability. They're using both their computers to go ahead and attack American <laughs> systems. And so as a result, you find out that you don't have to have a huge industrialized base to go ahead and compete effectively in the world of cyber. And I think we're going to see a stronger coupling of cyber with kinetic attacks. Now, I don't think anybody's going to saw off the branch everybody's sitting on. Because, hey, if you can steal information across the internet, if you can go ahead and manipulate your opponent's perceptions across the internet, why take it down? Yet, there are still people who go out there and blow themselves up and take themselves out and thinking that they're launching an attack, so I wouldn't fully count that out, that there might not be some damage that could go that way. And the attacks are going to get faster, they're going to get more precise, and I think the effects are going to be greater as we link more and more things together, and as a result, we can have cascading failures in systems. And the real concern, and this is what we have to ask our senior leadership, is that are we preparing for the wars that we want to fight, or are we going to have to prepare, are we able to prepare for the wars that we're going to have to fight? And my concern is that we often look in the rearview mirror and say, you know what, we're getting really, really good at this insurgent warfare thing, so we're going to promote our officer corps based upon their abilities of insurgent warfare. We're going to tour and retour and re-retour everybody over in what was Iraq and Afghanistan, now Afghanistan, until you get to the point where you've got this amazing insurgent warfare capability. And then the next battle is something else entirely. You go back and you look at Gulf One, that worked well to our favor. Why? Because the United States since 1945 and the Allies were getting ready to fight what? Soviet Union coming through the full to gap with tanks. And Saddam Hussein said, I challenge you to a tank battle <laughs> with no trees and no mountains and no rocks and nothing in the way. And we're going like, dude, you serious? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Or in the words of Arnold, bad idea. So other nations watch that. They learn from it. They're not going to go ahead and challenge us face to face because our defense department has kinetic warfare capabilities unequal to anybody else, which is why you look at asymmetry. So you're really concerned about nuclear weapons programs in places like Iran because they say we don't have to field a big standing army. We can just go ahead and leapfrog all that. If we can get a device planted somewhere in the U.S. and it's not just the subject of a Tom Clancy novel anymore, there's an opportunity that we could achieve some sort of parity. And now that we can influence the United States in ways that we think that we want to. So, bottom line, I hope not. Uh, this is a quote that I, this is a statement I made on September 10th, 2001, is that I was speaking at the EGOV conference and in the Q&A session, I said the problem is America has to get sucker punched before we recognize the emergence of a new threat because someday we're going to have to take a hit and we're not going to recover from it. By the way, that afternoon I got in the car and I drove up to New York because Tuesday, September 11, 2001 was my first day on the job working for Ernst & Young. They hired me to run their Wall Street security practice and I got there at 8 o'clock in the morning. And 46 minutes later, of course, the first plane at the World Trade Center. I put uh, on the 10th anniversary, so September 11, 2011, just Google GMark or put GMark Hardy into YouTube. I've got a little talk that I gave for the uh, Navy Leadership School because I ended up being you know, the senior guy on scene. So, uh, you know, a bunch of guys standing around like, who's in charge? They said, well, you don't have any officers. It's like, all right, you got me. Um, not that's something I wanted to do, but it was an interesting exercise in terms of what do you do when something that absolutely did not plan on takes place. So we've got to be careful that America does not take that sucker punch. So those are my thoughts on hacking as an act of war. We've got about nine or ten minutes for questions. Thank you very much. You first. Yeah. All right. Audience. Yeah. Applause first. Yeah. By the way, my opinions do not reflect the opinions of the United States government or the Department of Defense. Apropos of that, can you comment on how you think the Pentagon Doctrine of Equivalence is going to shape international norms? Be more specific. By shaping international norms, how do I cause other nations to? Got it. So how many combatant commanders today can fight a war on cyber? 
Eh, sorry, you can fight a war in land, sea, and air. That's what we train him for. I worked on a staff of combatant commander for two years. Pardon? Well, Cyber Command doesn't have command of operational forces, okay? Geographic combatant commander. But you know, the whole problem is what he's saying is the U.S. government is talking about a DOD a doctrine equivalent saying, well, cyber is just like everything else. And it's not like the old Elmo thing. One of these things is not like the other. And, you know, which one is it? All those, ten, uh, those combatant commands? That's that one. They're different. And the concern that I have, though, is that as we look at how we fight our wars, Post Goldwater Nichols and things like that, how do we organize our forces? The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff doesn't call the things the combatant commanders. So U.S. Pacific Command, U.S. Central Command, organization like that, those are the four stars that are in charge of the warfare. And all the services do is man, train, and equip. So if you're the chief of naval operations, and all you're going to do is providing the manning, the training, and equipping of people to go ahead and do that. So what we find out going forward is that in the cyber realm, if we're going ahead and we are handing over to NSA, handing over to Cyber Command, responsibility for running a cyber war, that's sort of like Captain Kirk going to Spock, analysis please. By the time Spock completes his analysis, you know, he's an analyst, all right? General Alexander is a smart guy, a very capable guy, very one, but he was not trained as a trigger puller. Okay, I spent my career, I spent over 30 years as a line officer trained to go ahead and make those, kind of, those decisions. And so the concern that I have is none of my peers could operate at this level here in this group and it's going to be a, number, a few more years before we get a couple people that are there. So the doctrine of equivalence, I think, is an ambitious idea. I don't think we're there yet because we can't implement it because we don't have people who think in the wire yet. That's my humble opinion. Do you have the equivalence of the hotline? Though, no, are we out of time? Yeah, we need to get somebody with a wheelchair on. We need to get six minutes. All right, need to get somebody out of here in six minutes? or in six minutes. All right, we'll be out here in six minutes. No, 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 no. We have to start the next talk in six minutes, and it involves someone with a wheelchair. Very well. Okay, let's go to talk out in the hallway, and we'll let someone with the... Uh, we'll sure get in here. Thank you very much.